Father, we, we want to ask for grace and help now in this moment. We love singing your praises. We love worshiping you. And we have the privilege of seeing you high and lifted up on the pages of your word, glorified in a way that only you can glorify yourself. And so now, as we turn our attention to truth, as we turn our attention to your scriptures, remind us that this is exactly uh, the perspective on you and on your son, the perspective on your gospel that we must have, that we need. And so we ask that your spirit would take this truth, that it would activate it and make it effective, bring it to fruition in our hearts. We, we need your help because, Lord, apart from you, we can do nothing. Left to ourselves, we could easily ignore truth or be merely amused by it. We might even consider it, but to embrace it and cherish it where it convicts us naturally. We would never do this apart from your, your help. And so we ask that you would help us to glorify you by submitting and embracing and acting on all that we see and hear in your word. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you may take a seat, and as you do that, grab your Bible and open up to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. We're going to continue on our exposition of Mark. We've been going through this incredible gospel for, for a few months now, and we find ourselves in the middle of chapter 2. And as you're turning there, and as we're, uh, even before we read the passage, before we read the narrative, I just want to kind of prepare you for the, the, the punch of this story, the truth of this story, with, um, with a question. Who is the gospel for? Whom should we hold the gospel out to? Who do we offer the gospel to? Is there any race, gender, social class that should be exempt from hearing the gospel? Absolutely not. Obviously, the scriptures make that very clear. Even Paul himself, preaching in Acts chapter 17, says, The times of ignorance, therefore, God overlooked, but now he commands that all people everywhere should repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. So in this sense, the offer of the gospel is inclusive. No one is to be excluded. However, the scriptures also highlight that with regards to the audience or the offer of the gospel, there is one condition. Tragically, there's one category of humanity that are excluded from Christ's offer of the gospel. And that may shock you by, by hearing that, but that is the fact here in Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. The only category of man that is excluded from Christ's offer of the gospel is a category unlike any of those previously mentioned. Uh, those previously mentioned, or if I listed out race and gender and social status, those are all external, those are all physical or genetic, or they pertain to nobility or ability or finances. And there's no exclusion on those categories. And Paul made that very clear. Not many wise, not many noble, and the, the wealthy Countess of Huntingdon who loved the Lord used to say, I was saved by an M, <laughs> but it didn't say not any wealthy, not many wealthy. There's no exclusions based on those external or social or ability types of status. The only category of man excluded from the offer of the gospel is a moral category. Jesus did not come to offer the gospel to the righteous. Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. He went out again by the seashore, and all the people were coming to him, and he was teaching them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. And it happened that he was reclining at the table in his house, 
And many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many of them, and they were following him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said, he said to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You know, the way Mark sets up this story, he does not let us forget um, that Jesus' priority is teaching, teaching the word, teaching the gospel. Uh, he says that in verse 13, that he goes out again by the seashore and the important information that he wants in our minds as we read the following story is this reality that people are, he now has such a level of popularity, everybody's thronging to him, and he's still teaching. He's still at it. His teaching ministry, his preaching ministry is now as ever his priority. He hasn't let off of that. Uh, if it gets prohibited him because of the degree of popularity from his miracles, he might have to go preach in rural areas, but he is not stopping. He continues to preach. He continues to teach. And so as Jesus continues his preaching ministry and his teaching ministry, he tells one particular shocking story. Now, every story in this gospel is shocking. I mean, it's just like, you just, it's just always surprising. You start, you look at the next story, you're like, okay, now we're going to get onto this normal, boring, humdrum story. It just never gets there. I mean, everything is shocking. But we've seen shocking miracles. We've seen shocking treatments of individuals. Here, we see this incredible, shocking account of who Jesus is associating with, even socially. And obviously, that social engagement has a deeper reflection of a spiritual reality. In verse 13 and 14, we see the call of Levi, or the call of the disciple named Matthew. And this is, the, this is when the, the Matthew who wrote the Gospel of Matthew was saved. This is his story. This is his conversion, at least when he formally began to follow Jesus as his disciple. And so I kind of just asked the question that I started with, and just to work us through this narrative, whom does Jesus call? And in verses 13 and 14, the, we could ask the question, sinners? And the answer is obviously yes. And then in 15 to 17, he adds to that, and the answer there, the question there is, the righteous? And the answer is absolutely not. Notice what Mark records for us. This particular action sequence starts in verse 14. He passes by, and he sees Levi. Levi is a Another name from Matthew, you can read the parallel in, in Luke's gospel uh, and uses the name Matthew, son of Alphaeus. And so here he is, and he's sitting in a tax booth. And some people, some commentators have been confused by that because it would seem like you would have a tax booth or some sort of uh, collections office working for Caesar in massive metropolitan areas. And that's probably true. I'm sure there were. But it's also true that historically we can document um, that there are inscriptions, and we've documented inscriptions in modern-day Turkey and in all over the Greco-Roman Empire, um, uh, where there's reference made to those who are concerned with toll even on fish. And so this would still have an element of income tax, but it would probably have been different in a, in, um, in a city that's known for its commercial fishing industry. Uh, Matthew or Levi could quite well have been a tax collector for the fishing industry. Uh, we don't know that for sure, but certainly he's collecting taxes. And what's interesting about this is, no doubt in a town the size of Capernaum, all of these disciples knew Levi. And what's virtually inarguable is if he is running a tax office that's collecting tax on the revenue from the fishing industry, he, it's virtually impossible to argue with the fact that the disciples would have known Levi. You need to understand something when it comes to taxes. The Greek word for tax comes from a compound word, the first word meaning toll, and the second being the root that is a verb that means to buy. And you buy access to collect the tolls or the taxes from Rome. And the way it worked is the Roman, Greco-Roman Empire expanded. It became too problematic to collect taxes from all of those massive, this just sprawling empire. And so they would hire um, tax collectors, tax farmers. It was kind of like it's a, it's a spot or a position or a role or an office that you could actually acquire, you could bid on, and it would almost go to the highest bidder. 
And so what would happen is, um, you know, when, when prefects and Roman-born governors are working their way up through the political hierarchy, they might take an outpost, or they might take a prefect over some outlying region, and they wouldn't have enough local knowledge or understand the, the, even geography, let alone customs, let alone background and, and worldview, to really be an effective tax collector. And so they would hire it out and farm it out to local people who had the local knowledge. And then what would happen is... Um, Basically, you would buy the right to be that official for that prefect. So I'm going to collect taxes for you from this said area, and if I collect all these taxes, uh, I will give them to you, and I will even get my income from what's collected over the prescribed amount necessary for the Ro Roman Empire. So what ends up happening is the, the highest bidder gets the right to collect that money. It, it could actually, it's interesting, I, I, there's, there's one article I've, I've read mentions that it could backfire even on the uh, government if everybody in that locality kind of went into cahoots together and decided to lowball the bid. <laughs> um, but you can kind of get a picture, you kind of get a sense of what's happening here with this tax industry. Um, the, what, what's, what's obvious about this is if you think about it from a Jewish perspective, from the Jewish perspective, it's just, it's just an insult that there is even a Roman authority over the land. The very fact that Rome has control over Israel that they would even have to pay tax to is a reminder of their moral failure. It's a reminder of the, the fact that the promises given in Torah are not even being fulfilled. And so the very sheer fact of taxes being paid to Rome is just insulting. And what's worse is when a Jew would bid for that and take up that role. And what's even worse than that is when a Jew would bid for it and take up that role and get rich off of his fellow kinsmen to distribute those taxes to Rome and make a lucrative living when the very industry is viewed as treason. Tax gatherers were despised in rabbinical Judaism for three reasons, really. Number one, they associated with Gentiles. Number two, they were regarded as thieves themselves. And number three, uh, while direct taxes were viewed as um, submission, indirect taxes like tolls or tariffs, were viewed as deceit, injustice, or even chicanery. So here, when you show up at this story and you're in Capernaum, most likely dealing with a man doing a toll tax on the commercial fishing industry, uh, it's viewed as entirely, uh, in, in, entirely um, unnecessary and unjust. And so... Jesus is going about his merry way, continuing to teach, continuing to preach, continuing to call sinners to repent. And verse 14 just says, as he passes by, he sees Levi, and there he is, and he's collecting taxes. And no doubt he's known by everyone. Jesus simply says to him, follow me. Now again, this isn't the whole story about every encounter with Jesus and Matthew. Um, when you start reading all four Gospels, and even we did that a little bit back in chapter 1 when he called Simon and Andrew and um, here, uh, it just simply records that he calls Levi, and if I go back and forth between Levi and Matthew, forgive me. But here, as he calls Levi, he just simply says, follow, and the, the, the text records, and he got up and followed him. Now, that has the effect of, basically, to the Jews, Jesus just called, you know, picture your, your, your spaghetti western, you know, two people, you know, slinging slanderous names at each other yellow-bellied, no good. I mean, it's just, it's worse. Take that times 10, and now you have the religious zeal of devotion to Yahweh and loyalty to the nation. And this man is absolutely an unjust criminal. He should be despised by the religious establishment. He should be despised by the nation. And Jesus comes along and calls him? Calls him to come follow? Calls him to come be part of his Band his group of disciples whom he's training to become preachers of repentance? What? They're shocked. Jesus is obviously calling a sinner. Matthew is, and Levi, Levi here, Levi is clearly in the category of sinner. 
The Jews had all sorts of categories of sinner, and that's, that's what Jesus picks up on here in um, the next half of this story. And so, does Jesus call sinners? Yes, absolutely. Does he call righteous? No. And believer, this, this second half of the story might shock you because what we're about to see is that Jesus actually did not come to call the righteous. For man who is righteous, there's actually no hope. There's no help. There's no offer of the gospel. Let's pick it up in verse 15. And it happened that he was reclining at the table in the, his house. Okay, now, we already have pronouns stacking up here, and I don't want to belabor a point that might be obvious in some of your minds, because it actually becomes very important when we get to the call in verse 17. In verse 15, um, notice that what I just read there in the NAS, you have the pronoun he, he's reclining at the table in his house, and the NAS does it great. It's a great translation. It, capital H-E, but lowercase H-I-S. Why is that important? Because if the second his there, the second pronoun, which is translated his, if that was Christ as well, it should have been capitalized. But, you know, the, and, and some commentators have said, oh, this is Jesus in Simon Peter's house. But, but he's not in Simon Peter's house. Uh, Jesus does not have a house. And Simon Peter's house very well did function as headquarters for his earthly ministry out of Capernaum. But it's never called Jesus' house. The, the, his house here is Levi's house. And this is important when it comes to the call of Jesus because he is not calling people into his party. This is not some sort of mere invitation to dinner. He's actually the guest at this dinner. He's at Matthew's house, Levi's house. And so here he is reclining at Levi's house. So Levi throws a party. Jesus is there. And furthermore, it has to be Levi's house because if it was Jesus' house, the, the fact that they were hanging out with Jesus would have been redundant. Basically, Levi throws a party, Jesus is a guest, and everyone's hanging around with Jesus. <laughs> he is undoubtedly, and not shockingly, the life of the party. Everybody is talking to Jesus, they're hanging out with him. It says many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many of them, and they were following him. So you have, out of this ragtag group of society, namely the, those who've committed treason against God by, by getting rich off of this alliance with secular, pagan, Gentile Romans, like tax collectors, and the sinners who are the worst moral class of society, the outcasts, the thieves, and the prostitutes, out of that group, there are many who are following Jesus. Many. Why are there so many at this party? for the simple explanation that there were many of them and that there were many of them following Jesus. There's a lot of in that category in Israel, and there's a lot in that category following Jesus. That's why there's many. That's interesting. Jesus came to call sinners. And so we should see and we should know outright, just understanding the social dynamic, that Jesus is not at his house. He is not throwing a party. And so when he turns around to talk about a call, he is not inviting people to a meal. He's inviting people to salvation in the Son of God. But here's where the story goes. Verse 16. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? Now, that's a, that's a reasonable question, but to appreciate it, I want to make sure and give a little bit more background. Table fellowship is obviously very significant. It's very significant in the, in the Jewish mindset. It's, it should be very significant in the Christian mindset. Let me give you a couple examples from the Old Testament, and you, can just, you don't have to turn here if you want. You can just listen, but I'm going to read to you a couple couple uh, stories, one from 2 Samuel, and you remember here, this is um, David and Mephibosheth, and I want you to hear the words that David uses to talk about the significance of this table fellowship with Mephibosheth. Uh, we'll pick it up in verse 7. Uh, it's already introduced Mephibosheth, who's the son of Jonathan, David's good friend, and so now in verse 7, 2 Samuel 9, 7, you can just listen or follow along. David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan. 
and will restore to you all the land of your father, your grandfather, Saul, and you shall eat my, at my table regularly. Again, he prostrated himself and said, What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? Then the king Saul, uh, called Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him, and you shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And listen to this. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the, command, uh, my, my lord the king commands, his servant, your servant, will do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. Think about the richness of that kind of fellowship right there. Let me give you one more example. At the end of David's life in 1 Kings chapter 2, he's giving a charge to his son Solomon, and he's basically saying, hey, look, we've, we've, the Lord's been really gracious, and here's just a little, a little knock list, a little punch list of... Um, you know, things we need to knock out here, the things you need to do at the beginning of your reign. It's just what's left over, the stuff we haven't got to yet. So he just starts working through some of the business that Solomon needs to attend to. And one of the things that he mentions is a man, uh, a man in verse 7 named Barzillai the Gileadite. And he says in verse 7, But show kindness to the sons of Barzillai the Gileadite, and let them be among those who eat at your table. For they assisted me when I fled from Absalom your brother. And so there's a kindness being shown to these, these men who were descended, probably sons, probably first-generation sons of Barzillai, who helped out David during Absalom's coup. And so here's two examples where this table fellowship is, is, is pictured in rich, rich com camaraderie and harmony. And so, you know, this isn't just like, you know, an, a one-meal type of fellowship. This is an ongoing type of fellowship where these people are prepared and cared for and taken care of in an ongoing fashion, and it's viewed as they have just been welcomed into the family. What's shocking for the scribes of the Pharisees is that he's, is who he's eating with and who he has chosen to have fellowship with. And we need a little bit more background still on verse 16. Even on the, the word sinners... You say, well, John, I, we're, we're well taught here. I think we know what the word sinner means, and I, and I know you do. It's interesting, though, that in Scripture, the word sinner is really used two different ways. There's the, there's the theological, biblical definition, and then there's the say it with disdain in your voice, just self-righteousness and indignation, just ugh, sinners. And Jesus uses it both ways. Paul uses it both ways. You remember Paul saying, we're not like those sinners from among the Gentiles. It's just dripping with disdain. Here, the scribes of the Pharisees, by the way, the scribes of the Pharisees are those who have studied the law. They're the experts of the law. So it's a special category of the Pharisees who are involved in the interpretation and the application of the Torah and the prophets to Jewish life. And so these are the ones who are worried about ceremonial cleanliness, who we fellowship with, who we don't fellowship with, and they have done a pretty good job by the day of Jesus Christ of actually creating a new category of sinner that's not even a biblical category of sinner. In other words, this group described from verse 13 to 15 are flat out biblical sinners, and they are flat out pharisaically defined sinners. <laughs> I don't know if that's clear enough to say it both ways. <laughs> if that's <laughs> too subtle, you know, sinners, theological sinners, the way the Pharisees define it. But it becomes two different categories. It's interesting, as I was looking back at some of the um, Jewish material, I came across one resource that said, for the Pharisee, a sinner is one who does not subject himself to the Pharisaic ordinances. And if you don't submit yourself to the Pharisaical ordinance, in other words, it's not what the Bible says, it's what the Pharisees say is the prescription to avoid what the Bible says. If you don't comply with that, you earn a label. And the Jewish label is Am Ha'aretz, people of the land. 
It's a, it would have been, you just say it the same way as sinner. <laughs> people of the land, ugh. They're just the people who don't, they don't, they don't obey custom. They, they, don't, they don't do what the Pharisees say. I mean, this is somebody who does not follow their prescriptions. He's a sinner because he violates not the law, but because he does not endorse the Pharisaic interpretation. And so that's exactly the problem here. The Mishnah describes a debate between rabbis, and this debate well could have been um, contemporary with Christ. And it records um, a description of who you can associate with, and it says, he who undertakes to be trustworthy is someone who uh, ties all of his produce, what he eats, what he sells, what he purchases, and then here's the fourth category of being a trustworthy individual. He does not accept the hospitality of the Am Ha Eretz, the people of the land. If you want to have integrity in Israel, you, you, you tithe, you tithe what you eat, you tithe what you sell, you tithe what you purchase, but by all means, you don't dare accept the hospitality of someone who isn't following the scruples of Pharisaic interpretation. One rabbi, <laughs> Rabbi Judah, says, well, one who accepts the hospitality of an of a Am Ha'aretz is trustworthy. And that it's quoted, and then it just goes right back to the, to the former interpretation. I think, I think clearly Rabbi Judah was, in, was losing this debate in the uh, rabbinical uh, debate. And so they go on to say that if you're trustworthy, you do not accept the hospitality of Am Ha'aretz, and, uh, and, and secondly, you do not um, receive them as a guest. So it goes both ways. You wouldn't accept them into your home, and you wouldn't accept their invitation into, your, into their home. That is, that is not Old Testament. That is Pharisaical tradition. The Babylonian Talmud says that it's in, inappropriate for a scholar to recline in the table, at the table in the company of ignorant persons. The Jerusalem Talmud says, let not a Pharisee eat the sacrifice with the people of the land. I mean, the Jewish literature is full of this prohibition. You do not associate with somebody who is not obeying these scruples. And so they see it. In verse 16, these scribes of the Pharisees, they see it. They see it happening. Jesus himself is violating that standard. He's associating with, he has accepted the hospitality of Ha'am Haaretz people of the land, including all the tax collectors, Levi and all of his friends, anybody in the category, moral category of uh, unclean, prostitute, sinners, liars, and thieves. And notice who, he, who this, the scribes of the Pharisees say it to. They say it to his disciples. And what's interesting is they're really kind of undermining Jesus' training of these men. And what's interesting, too, is, it's, you know, you, I don't want to read too much into that, but it's almost like after last week's story, where they just said it to themselves and it wasn't even voiced and Jesus just jumped right in and had a conversation with their inner monologue. They're like, well, if we're going to get caught, we might as well just undermine him and talk to his disciples. So they he talks to the disciples. They just, hey, guys, listen, this is what's going on. You see what's going on? You see what your master's doing over here? And they're having a private conversation. Verse 17, hearing this, Jesus said to them, you know, what is this, like the supersonic ear? He just here, it's like a private under, you know, back alley, back alley, you know, subterfuge, trying to just discredit Jesus behind his back. And he's just like, yeah, that's a good point. Let's talk about that. Whoa. Just, I mean, just, <laughs> here it is again. He hears what they're saying, and he just responds in a very simple way. It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This axiom is used all over Greek literature. The Spartan king, Pausanias, was asked why he left Sparta for Turgia when he actually was fond of the Spartans, and his answer was this. It's not the custom of doctors to spend their time with the healthy, but where people are ill. It's used of doctors with the sick. It's used of philosophers with the unlearned. The healthy don't need a doctor's services. The wise 
don't need a philosopher's instruction. And so similarly, the righteous don't need Christ's ministry. The second half of this axiom makes a parallel with Jesus' call to sinners. Now, I want to just slow down here for a second. Let's go back to verse 17 and notice Jesus uses the word call. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And so as I mentioned already, this call does not refer to just an invitation to a meal. It's not even his house. This took place at Levi's house. But theologically, we need to have a quick conversation here. What what is this word call? What's it referring to? The word call in the scripture quite often is used for an effectual call, uh, the call of God to sinners that that it brings a sinner to himself. It could be used in the category of election and predestination. In fact, that's, that's the way it's always used in the epistles. In Romans 8, for example, those whom God foreknew, he predestined, and those whom he predestined, he called, and those whom he called, he justified. There's not an individual in the way that Paul is using the word call who does not end up being justified and who does not end up being glorified. There's no breakdown in that category. The called are always the glorified. So that is an effectual call that cannot be broken. However, the call here, and as is quite typical in the Gospels, is used in a different sense. And this is, it's used in the same sense here as Jesus uses it in, in Matthew 22, verse 14. Jesus says, many are called, but few are chosen. So this is not the word for the, the choice or the uh, effectual call. This is the word for the offer of the gospel. This is profound. The offer of the gospel. You think, oh, what does that mean? Did Jesus just say, I did not come to offer the gospel to the righteous, but to sinners? Yes, that's what he's saying. He's saying the gospel is not for the righteous. This is startling. You think, well, what does that mean for us? Well, we'll get there, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean that we would know who the righteous and who the sinners are. But it does mean that the gospel is for those who know they're sinners. There is no such thing as a faithful preaching of the gospel without helping that individual understand that they are in the category of sinner. If somebody is under the delusion that they are not a sinner, there's no gospel for them. There's no help from the cross. There's no help from Christ. I, I couldn't help but step back. I'm, and technically, we've, we've finished the, the story, verses 13 to 17. And I think it's appropriate at this point to kind of just step back and just think for a second. Christians, think about what we just read. Jesus just got through exposing a religious institution that has created a category of sinner. It's not even the same as God's category of sinner. And he offers the gospel to those who have clearly violated God's righteous standard, and they know it, and they respond. Many respond. There's many of them, verse 15, and there many of them were following him, 15c. And he's addressing these people, and their category of sinner has been contaminated. It's been perverted and twisted. The the, the biblical category of uh, of sinner, the biblical definition of sinner, has become sinner. And it's been contaminated by man-made interpretation, man-made tradition. And man-made tradition is now speaking louder in the Jewish context than the very word of God. And people who are under that kind of religious instruction can hardly hear the word of God because whenever the word of God is opened, it's given a rabbinical interpretation. So now you have people who are actually in their sins being cut off from the hope of the promise in the Torah and in the Old Testament because of a perverted interpretation from these Pharisees. This ought to get our blood boiling. We ought to feel the weight of souls in sin, under condemnation, who don't even know it, 
Because the category of sinner has been perverted, become something that God never meant it to be. And so I stepped back from the story and I started thinking, what are those categories for us? What are the categories that we face where America has given us a different definition of sinner? We have taken biblical sin and called it virtue, and political correctness has reversed what's biblically a virtue and what's biblically a vice. And we have people who are sinners and don't know it and render themselves outside the offer of the gospel because they don't even know they need it. Here's a couple of examples that are just quick and easy. Appealing back to Omri's work in the um, equipping hour several months ago uh, when he did his, his work on um, social justice and wokeism as it's affecting the church. Well, if we're going to be faithful with the gospel, if the church is going to be faithful to offer the gospel to sinners, we have to wake up to the sin of wokeism because Jesus did, in fact, come to call racists. But wokeism says that systemic racism, the idea that hegemony or a majority class, members in that majority class benefit from the oppression of the smaller classes in ways that they're unaware of to the degree that simply being in a majority class makes you a racist due to your belonging to that class. And that's a ho hopefully a somewhat accurate summary of, of his five-week series, which was excellent. What that means is, I'm a racist at heart because I'm white. Let's just say that's the improper interpretation. I come to the gospel. Christ didn't come to die for people who are white. He didn't come to die to save you from your race. He didn't come to die to save you from your background. He didn't come to die to save you from your heritage or your upbringing, as good or bad as it might be. He didn't come to save you from a bad childhood or bad circumstance. He came to save you from your sin. And if, if my sin is racism, there's hope in the gospel. If my sin is being white, I have no hope. We've turned virtue and vice on its head. Another area where we've done this, where our sin-sick soul has become misdiagnosed is through um, the widespread pandemic of psychiatric diagnoses. Diagnoses like fear, anxiety, guilt, shame. They become the mark of a disorder. And the Bible puts that in the category of theological sinner. And here comes an interpretation that makes sin more just a symptom and makes you even a victim of a disorder. We might blame it on genetics. We might blame it on upbringing. We might blame it on a relationship. We might blame it on other people or any other circumstance. We could possibly do so. But the point is, Christ did not lay down his life for those who suffer from disorders, for, for victimization, for being unjustly treated, he did not lay down his life for those who've been financially defrauded. He did not become a substitute for people who are unpopular or have unmet expectations. He offers himself as a sacrifice, as a substitute for those who have sinned against his father. He came to die for people who are guilty for not worshiping God in all of his glory, for starting to worship creature, created glory, self. He came to die for those whose souls are so corrupt that they, they've lived in this criminal underworld in God's universe. They've committed high treason with a high hand against the one and only living God. Clearly, believers, we 
live in a pharisaical culture. It doesn't, it doesn't look like pharisaism. It's going to be articulated in different ways, but we clearly have our own man-made categories of sin and sinner. Political correctness has become American tradition. Man-made virtues are biblical sins, and man-made vices have become, are actually the biblical standards of righteousness. Listen, all of these false interpretations cut the audience off from the offer of the gospel. Think for a second about the nature of the gospel. Romans 4, verse 5, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the righteous. No, no, a thousand times no. He's the God who justifies the ungodly. To that man, his faith is credited as righteousness. Romans 5, 6, for while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the righteous. No, for the ungodly. Verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Listen, let me just speak to you, you big group of sinners. We're all sinners. It's my job as a preacher of the gospel, a herald of the message of Jesus Christ, to qualify you for the gospel. If you are a relatively decent person, there is no hope for you. If you're a victim of your circumstances, neither Jesus nor any of his preachers have a gospel to offer you. If your identity is just simply uh, been mistreated, I've got some bad things going in my life, unless your identity is actually I'm a criminal against God. I've stolen his glory. I've spit in his face. I've lived for self-glory when I was created to worship him. If if your identity is anything less than that, then you have no invitation. A few months ago, I had a friend who um, plays plays, uh, professional baseball, and he 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 said he was coming to play the, the Diamondbacks, and so he, uh, he, he got us tickets, and we, we got to sit, sit there in the, in the stands. And, you know, and I guess, I guess all the, all the you know, we, were, we were clearly out of our league uh, because everybody in that little section was like, you know, uh, you know, personally somebody, let's just say socially. And so we were, uh, t- I started talking to the guy next to me, and, and he was uh, you know, telling me who, who he got his tickets from, you know, this, uh, this all-star, you know, and he was just really excited about him. And so we started chatting, and it was a great conversation, really friendly guy. And... and um, he, he, asked, he asked me about me and asked me what I did for a living. He heard I was a pastor, and you know, that's a, always a great way to start sharing the gospel, right? You know, it's like at that point, an otherwise friendly conversation, it was like all of a sudden, they're like, oh, yeah, uh, yes, sir, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. And it's like, can we just talk? And so we, we've already reached that point. And um, so he says, he, says, um, he says, yeah, yeah, the, you know, the player that gave me the tickets, you know, he's a believer. And I said, oh, yeah, so is, so is, so is my friend. And so we started talking about what Christianity is. And it was just interesting. His interpretation is, yeah, you know that there are, there are so many Christians in Major League Baseball? Huh. Tell me about that. That's, that's a little different interpretation than my friend gave me, but yeah, tell me about that. <laughs> and so, we start, so I start realizing, you know, we have a different definition of Christianity. And he says, um, he says, yeah, yeah, we're Christians and love the Lord. And I said, okay, well, tell me how you came to know the Lord. When did you first love Christ? When did your view of sin change? What? I started sharing with him about my, my own testimony, and I got to the point where, at the age of 19, I knew for the first time that my life was miserable because I hated God. I walked him through the circumstances that God used to get me there, and I told him, I knew that I was the most wicked being in the face of God's universe because he'd been nothing but kind and faithful to me and I had done nothing but spit in his face. And I mean, at this point, we're not even watching the game and his jaw's on the floor and he literally just said, whoa. Now, there's nothing dramatic about my testimony 
uh, circumstantially. There's everything dramatic about my testimony theologically. And I don't know that he'd ever heard that before. There is no hope for the righteous. There's not even an offer of the gospel for the righteous. The gospel's for sinners. Richard Sibbs, and his Bruised Reed is our book of the month, he said as in that book, a good opinion of the physician, we say, is half the cure. Can I just ask you to consider your opinion of the physician? A high opinion of the physician would include a high opinion not just of his prescription or his solution, it would also include a high opinion of his pathology. In other words, his diagnosis would also receive the same high opinion. Sinner, do you believe that you are morally superior to the tax collector, to the prostitutes gathered at Levi's house? Do you believe that by nature you put a bigger smile on God's face than a Hitler or a Saddam Hussein? If righteousness comes from avoiding certain external manifestations of sin, like fornication or murder, then Christ died needlessly. Obviously, Christ did not die needlessly, but it remains an unnecessary and wasted sacrifice for you if you remain righteous in your own eyes. Tragically, the gospel is not offered to you. Sinner, if you know you're a sinner and you're guilty of God, the gospel is offered to you. Repent. Trust in Christ. You might, have, you might be sitting here hearing this story and thinking, man, all those extreme examples, that's actually me. Good news. There's hope for you. The people who are hearing this who say, glad I'm not like that, there's no hope for them. But if you know that you have sinned against God, if you know that you have not given him the glory that he deserves, there is hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ for every sinner here this morning. Father, we're so thankful. This story has filled our hearts with gratitude. It's filled our hearts with hope. It has just once again given us clear perspective on the gospel. And Lord, it's such a simple story, and it so profoundly undermines the false narrative spun by the Pharisees. Lord, I just pray that this morning this profound story would also uncover and unravel the false narrative on any sinner who does not know you. I pray that they might see their need for you. They might see for the first time that they are guilty, that they are wicked, and they are a criminal in your universe. Uh, and being a criminal in your universe doesn't mean we have to be a criminal in society, it means we have to fail to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Lord, that's what you deserve. And to fall short of that is sin. And so I pray, Lord, that uh, you would use this to bring conviction to every sinner here. And Lord, I just, again, I just love how these, the beginning stories here in the Gospel of Mark, just so full and rich of the Gospel, uh, just minister to, to us as your people. And for Grace Bible Church, this, this sermon, Lord, was for your children. Uh, first and foremost, any, any unbeliever who hears this and benefits, we rejoice a thousand times in heaven. There's a hundredfold rejoicing in heaven for that sinner who repents. And Lord, here we've gathered as your church, and this, this story was for us. To see the glory of your Son on display. To see the profundity of his gospel. It's just overwhelming, Lord, to see you save the way you do. And that's that's our only hope. We do not have to look long or hard to see our sins before our conversion or to see our sins of last week to bask in the fact that you came to call the sin sick. Our souls, Lord, by nature are sick with sin. Thank you for the grace to wipe out the guilt associated with that sin that we did commit and also to give us 
a practical righteousness so that we can begin for the rest of our lives glorifying you with good works that we could never take credit for, that you are producing in us and through us by faith. So Lord, as we think about your son's teaching ministry on earth, his priority to preach the gospel, I pray that we would never lose sight of the fact that the gospel is for not the, not the righteous, but the ungodly. I pray that we would never forget that for ourselves, lest we become self-righteous, and we would never forget that in evangelism, lest we preach a righteousness of morality and man-made externals. Thank you. Thank you for your profound gospel. In your name we pray. Amen.